My name is Turin Trikista and I'm the director of the PRIO Center on Gender, Peace and Security uh, here at the Peace Research Institute Oslo. And it's a pleasure for me to welcome you all to um, this webinar on masculinity and militarism, moving beyond stereotypes. And this is the third uh, event in a series um, that we've been organizing during the last couple of, uh, of months. And it forms part of a new strategic initiative at PRIO, an initiative by the PRIO Research Group headed by Luis Olson and the PRIO GPS Center. And the PRIO GPS Center, we have been in existence now for quite a few years and we serve as a resource hub at PRIO um, on research, teaching and training on the, the gender dimensions of peace and conflict. But in practice, much of our gender research thus far has focused pr primarily on making the experiences, voices and contributions of women visible. So gender has in many ways been equated with women. With this new initiative, the purpose is to explore different aspects of men and masculinities in peace and conflict research and also the relationship perhaps more between men and women. And we hope that the outcome of this exploration will be new research initiatives and hopefully also new collaborative partnerships between PRIO researchers, between researchers at PRIO and at other academic institutions, and research and collaboration with policymakers and practitioners. Today's webinar is also an event uh, on the official program of the Oslo Peace Days, which is a joint initiative by the City of Oslo, the Nobel Peace Center, the Norwegian Nobel Institute, the University of Oslo and PRIO. And together we have established the Oslo Peace Days to show Oslo's credentials as an international city of peace and to create an arena where the population of Oslo and beyond can learn about and discuss issues related to peace, democracy and human rights. But now back to this morning's webinar. To discuss the topic of masculinity and militarism, we are pleased to have an exciting panel comprising of scholars engaged both in basic and applied research, as well as a practitioner representing the Norwegian Armed Forces. And to guide us through the next hour and a half, let me introduce the chair of the webinar, my good colleague, Henrik Sisa, who is a research professor at PRIO and professor of peace and conflict studies at the Oslo New University College, until fairly recently known as Björknes College. And he holds a doctorate in philosophy and is chief co-editor of the Journal of Military Ethics. And I could also add that he has written and co-edited a number of books, among them a book in Norwegian in, on just war and a volume on the ethics of war, classic and contemporary readings. So he is well placed to chair a seminar like this. Uh, I'll just give you the word, Henrik, and you will also introduce the speakers. So thank you and welcome everyone. Thank you so much, Turun. It's good to have your guidance into this uh, complex uh, question that we are delving into today and a special welcome from me too. I will leave most of the time for the uh, eminent speakers that we have, but I'll just try to introduce the topic very briefly first. And it takes us this point of departure stereotypes. It takes a real man to face such hardships. It's a man's world. We not uh, uh, least hear such tropes and phrases in connection with military force, which traditionally involves physically and mentally arduous tasks that can easily be gendered according to more or less traditional gender stereotypes. This is work for a man. So what roles do ideas of manhood or masculinity play in war and in other forms of organized political violence? This is the overarching question at the heart of today's seminar, which is also, as Tudin said, a proud part of the Oslo Peace Days. Researchers found a strong correlation between gender inequality on the one hand and the risk of political violence in any forms on the other, from state involvement in armed conflict to individual behavior in riots and protests. Explanations for this range from structural to individual, increasingly with a focus on attitudes, norms and ideas, indeed what I would call ethos and ethics connected to gender in general and to certain ideas of masculinity in particular, which idealize male toughness and patriarchy or glorify and celebrate violence or military might outright. 
States with higher levels of gender equality, on the other hand, appear to be more peaceful. More gender equal states and organizations mobilizing women have, however, also been found, interestingly, to be more effective when they do decide to wage war. Indeed, there are many complexities, puzzles and quandaries here. An especially poignant debate has circled around the question of whether a more equal military force with women enrolled alongside men will result in an improved and more effective military organization where the focus will be on competence and not on gender by rooting out negative masculine ideals, or whether it will just lead to an assimilation of women into existing militaristic masculine ideals, leaving the patriarchal institution intact, or indeed whether it might result in feminized and weak military organizations, some would say, you would call them woke, where ideals trump effectiveness. All of these standpoints can be found in the debate, and they illustrate the varying understandings of militarism, masculinities and gender equality that exist and that further complicate discussions, although also making them even more interesting. At the very least, we can agree that we need to move beyond stereotypes to address these important issues. And in doing that, we need to bring scholars and practitioners into dialogue. That's today's aim, to explore how we may understand the role of masculinities, military organizations and militarism in states that strive for both gender equality and peace, listening to both scholars and practitioners. Three questions stand at the core of this investigation today. First, what roles do understandings of masculinities play in men's participation and recruitment into militarized settings? Are they important today? And if so, how? Second, how does masculinity shape the military as an institution? And how does this impact efforts, uh, impact efforts to have a more inclusive military? And thirdly, what are the practical implications of improving our understanding of the relationship of masculinities and gender equality to the military? To answer this, we have three brilliant speakers today, and I do look forward to listening to them. They are my good colleague, Louise Ulsson, who is a senior researcher at PRIO. It's Erik Melander, who is professor in the Department of Peace and Conflict Research at Uppsala University in Sweden, a, an institution that PRIO has proudly collaborated with for many, many years. And Mikael Bas Bottenbeek Hartmann from the Norwegian Defense Staff. Very glad to have him with us as well as uh, today's foremost practitioner. I will introduce each right before they speak, and I start now with Erik. Erik Melander is a professor of peace and conflict uh, research, as I said, at Uppsala University. He's also director of the new Alva Mudal Center. That's opposite today, appropriate, as he was also a Nobel Peace Prize laureate. It's called the Alva Mudal Center for Nuclear Disarmament at Uppsala University. He was previously director of the Uppsala Conflict Data Program. His research interests include, among other things, the gender aspects of peace and conflict, uh, he is also a second lieutenant in the Swedish Home Guard and is served as a peacekeeper in Bosnia. He will provide us with an overview of the topic on masculinities and militarism, based not least on his own research. So it's a pleasure for me to give the floor to you, Erik. Thank you. And thank you for this opportunity to talk a little bit about my own research and the research by others. And uh, also, um, uh, give some reflections and uh, maybe some speculations on this uh, topic. Um, so I have a presentation. Um, yes, here we see the presentation. Um, so this is the opening slide and uh, we can move on to the first uh, content slide. So before uh, I get going, uh, I would just like to mention this um, so, um, to um, state my positionality, so to speak, uh, give a little bit of background. On, for my perspective on um, these issues. So I'm a researcher, but I also have military experience and I, I can state that I have a generally positive view of um, the Swedish military uh, because of this background. I was a peacekeeper in Bosnia, which was a great and uh, defining experience in many ways. And I'm still active in, uh, in the defense in, in the Home Guard. Uh, next slide, please. And also when we talk about masculinity and these issues, I think it is uh, a good idea to very briefly uh, repeat or state what these words mean, or at least what I mean with these words. And as soon as we talk about gender, uh, as in gender and conflict, for example, uh, I still encounter often the understanding that gender somehow means women, that uh, 
first of, uh, we talk about uh, peace and conflict or nuclear disarmament or whatever we are talking about uh, in the normal way, so to speak. And then when the word gender comes up, then it's time to speak about women. But of course, uh, that's not what a gender perspective means. Uh, likewise, uh, gender is not equal to biological sex. So if we, for example, disaggregate data by um, men and women, um, that's not um, gender, that's biological sex. It might provide important clues about how gender plays out. Uh, and it is important with uh, disaggregated data in many contexts, but it's not gender because gender is all the beliefs and uh, expectations that we have around what it means to be a real man or a real woman. And also, of course, other gender identities. And this pertains also to how we think about and how we, uh, how we um, attribute different expectations to people with different sexual orientations, for example. So when we talk about masculinities, we're going to talk about ideas uh, or rather ideals about manhood, what it means to be a real man. Uh, we can move on to the next slide, I think. And in particular, uh, what stands out as important in, in this context uh, when we analyze uh, the role of gender in, in violence and in peace and in the military and so on, is this concept of militarized masculinity, which is so important. And militarized masculinity captures the notion that traditionally men and boys have been raised and prepared for a warrior role, so to speak. Uh, so boys are encouraged to play rough and tumble games. Uh, men are thought to not show weakness and emotions. A real man needs to be tough and fierce and brave and warlike. Men mustn't accept disrespect. They must uh, react with violence or threats of violence if they are disrespected, otherwise they lose face. And in this system, women tend to serve as a kind of contrast category and also be assigned a subordinated nursing or supportive role in contrast down to how the real men are supposed to, to be. Um, and with this set of ideas also comes the notion that because men are warriors or potential warriors, they also deserve privilege, uh, not only in the family, but also in society. And men are entitled to these privileges and to be the decision makers because of their uh, masculinity and warrior role. Next slide, please. So to sum up this notion of militarized masculinity, uh, means that men are warriors and warriors are men, or it is the belief that that's the way it should be. So this also implies that not only that men need to be warlike and tough and all that, but also that real warriors are men. That's, that's uh, what is required of a warrior is that that person is, is a man. Uh, and it further implies that manhood, real manhood, is either acquired or proven through military service or action, uh, and in particular combat, combat experience. Uh, and a common expression in this context is that uh, being in, in the military or being a warrior makes men out of boys. And to the extent that, um, that um, this, the beliefs and attitudes and behaviors that come with militarized masculinity to the extent that they are acquired through military service or through being a warrior. We can talk about military socialization as the prime mechanism for creating these uh, attitudes and behaviors. And to the extent that men prove how manly they are by being warriors or serving in the military. Uh, then we can talk about self-selection into the warrior role and military organizations as the explanation for why we see these uh, attitudes and behaviors uh, in traditional military organizations so often. Uh, next slide, please. And masculinity is always defined in, in contrast to femininity and unmanly men in these belief systems. 
Um, and women are then supposed to play this nursing and supporting role that uh, I mentioned, but also as a kind of an audience in front of whom the men prove themselves to show that they are real men. Uh, and here you can read a quote from a uh, general in the US Marine Corps, uh, which basically shows that um, this is also a way of, of uh, uh, motivating men to, to fight, to make warriors out of men, that uh, they need this uh, idea that uh, they are the ones that sacrifice and fight to protect the weak women. Uh, and that's why they uh, are real men and deserve privileges. And it wouldn't work. This system of making men fight wouldn't work if women can do it too. Um, so um, those men who fail to man up or measure up in this sense are shamed and ridiculed uh, and uh, in a way that imply that they are uh, not real men. Next slide, please. But we all know that throughout history and in modern times especially, there are many, many women who have uh, served in the military or been warriors or generals and spies and so on. And done so uh, with excellent performance. Uh, so how can we reconcile that empirical fact with uh, uh, this idea about militarized masculinity, which is so influential traditionally in history, but also to a considerable extent still today in many contexts? Well, um, even though women can be and are uh, excellent warriors, uh, good soldiers uh, oftentimes, that um, proven record has typically been downplayed, uh, not talked about, or these female warriors have been portrayed as some kind of bizarre and freakish uh, people who uh, break taboos. And of course, in the first place, women have tended to be excluded, not allowed to serve, regardless of how competent uh, they are. And that is related to this um, mechanism of creating uh, men into warriors, that that mechanism breaks down to the extent that uh, we recognize that are, there are excellent uh, women warriors as well. Next slide, please. Looking at this uh, from a research point of view and uh, some empirical studies, um, a very clear result, which uh, of course is self-evident almost from, from uh, common knowledge reading newspapers, but perhaps not analyzed enough, is that men are the overwhelming perpetrators of all forms of violence, of physical violence. And that of course pertains to, to lawful violence. We think about soldiers in the military, uh, police, uh, security guards and so on. And it uh, holds for unlawful violence, uh, criminal violence, terrorists and so on. But even though there is this very, very strong pattern, most men never fight uh, physically. And this holds even in, in situations when uh, a full-scale civil war rages, uh, that uh, even then uh, a majority of men uh, of the appropriate age would not be actively fighting. So there seems to be something about being male or maleness or masculinity that drives participation in violence. Uh, participation in violence is clearly very uh, much uh, associated with uh, being male. But whatever that is, it seems to apply mostly or at least more to some men than to other men. Next slide, please. And this is where um, we think that uh, militarized masculinity, the, a set of attitudes that uh, come with militarized masculinity uh, provides an explanation. Some research on these attitudes um, pertain to um, uh, other um, attitudes and behaviors. For example, it has been found that people who embrace these attitudes um, also tend to embrace other violent or um, uh, intolerant attitudes. For example, support for um, torture of terrorist suspects. So these studies have asked a lot of people about uh, their views on gender equality, their views on what a real man should be like, um, and the role of uh, violence and so on. And they find these uh, associations. Um, 
Likewise, uh, men who embrace militarized masculinity uh, and similar uh, ideas uh, are also more prone to criminal violence, uh, including sexual violence and rape and other forms of violent crime. Uh, such men are also more prone to take excessive risks uh, and hence uh, are more prone to, say, motorcycle accidents and uh, workplace accidents and so on. And there's also an association with suicide and physical or so, sorry, uh, psychological unhealth, which has to do with this uh, requirement that real men mustn't show weakness uh, and hence cannot uh, seek help uh, when they need. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, I and colleagues, we provided uh, a contribution to this literature, adding uh, actual participation in political violence. We found that um, such attitudes uh, do predict uh, who among um, hardcore political activists in Thailand participated in, uh, in uh, riots and other forms of political violence uh, in that country. And we uh, talk about, uh, uh, in particular, what we call masculine honor ideology. So this is a, a form of uh, masculinity that uh, uh, is very close to or part of militarized masculinity. But we include the term honor because uh, it is established in, in the literature, from, uh, especially from anthropology and criminology, that uh, this particular aspect uh, drives violence meaning that people who uh, are very sensitive about their reputation and especially their reputation for fierceness and for domination and including domination the domination over the women in their family um, and uh, uh, their reputation for not backing down when challenged and so on uh, such men tend to be prone to to use violence and threats of violence to defend their honor in this sense so that's where the word honor comes from in, in this context. And we call it uh, ideology to stress that this is a variable that varies from man to man. It's not the same. Sometimes the, the word, um, the content, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, uh, the word uh, honor culture is used as a shorthand. So we can talk about the honor culture in the southern states of the, of, uh, the United States, for example. Uh, but um, that's just a shorthand and it, it's useful for some research purposes or discussing some things. But actually, this is a thing that uh, is different from man to man. And hence, we think about it as an ideology rather than as a cultural aspect, which is kind of uh, shaped by one's origins. Of course, if you add up many individual ideologies, uh, you can talk about the culture. But even within one and the same culture, you will find uh, that this uh, differs from uh, different individuals. And this turns out to be a very important explanation for a lot of um, behaviors that we are interested in, including participation in political violence. Next slide, please. And then um, I just want to mention this ongoing research. It has not been submitted to uh, a journal for peer review um, and the results are uh, preliminary. But I do think it is kind of uh, interesting that um, if you measure gender equality in a society um, using various indexes, and then you look at how well that society performed uh, on the battlefield in war, you find that uh, even if taking into account uh, that more gender equal societies tend to be more economically developed, uh, to be uh, uh, democracies and so on, even if you take that into account, you find that um, the more gender equal societies actually tend to perform better on the battlefield uh, than uh, less gender equal societies which goes against uh, a myth or an uh, widespread um, idea that uh, those societies that tell the population that men need to be men and men need to be the warriors who, who defend the, the women who take care of the children and raise the next generation of warriors and so on, those societies uh, are, are not more successful in war uh, when studying this systematically. Um, uh, so um, what that um, 
what explains that is an important is an interesting question um if the result holds for all the controls um, and uh, robustness checks and so on that i will carry out but i i think it is interesting in this context uh, it's also noteworthy i think in this context because it it is goes against this widespread relatively widespread uh misogynist uh, idea that actually uh is uh, part and parcel of fascist ideology that uh, uh like uh, fascist leader mussolini said before the second world war in italy uh war is to man as uh, motherhood is to women uh and this was not some kind of analysis of Miltra's masculinity, but it was stating his his ideal the way it should be. Uh, so I think it is quite interesting that uh, fascist states, for example, are not uh, on average uh, more effective in war than more democratic and gender equal states. Next slide, please. So um, those were some concepts and associations uh, found in, in research. And I will end my little presentation here with uh, some ideas about practical implications. Uh, why do I think this is important? Uh, what have we learned that we can apply uh, in practice? Well, a first set of practical implications uh, pertain to uh, the possibility to better identify who among a population are more likely to actually participate in physical violence. Um, and this has been discussed a little bit uh, in, in Sweden, for example, more recently in connection to violent crime, that uh, if we understand these mechanisms, we also understand uh, who, especially young men, are the most at risk to become violent criminals. Um, and this might also be useful, for example, when analyze, analyzing um, um, the, the location and the population uh, in a peacekeeping mission, for example. Um, this also then suggests activities, um, things to do, interventions to reduce the risk that people, especially young men, uh, become violent. Um, and uh, if we think that the driver of, of violence to a large extent pertains to uh, militarized masculinity, then maybe uh, one way of trying to prevent violence would be uh, to introduce uh, other forms of uh, masculinity as ideals, perhaps by working with uh, good male role models. Next slide, please. Um, and also because of the associations found in, in the research I mentioned and much other research, um, knowing about this might help us to reduce the risk that our own personnel commit various transgressions against local populations, say in a peacekeeping mission, or colleagues in, in a university, for example. So people with these attitudes are more likely to commit these uh, transgressions. And hence, uh, if we know about that, we can be uh, alert, we can think about that when recruiting people, and we can also work on uh, these attitudes so as to reduce these risks. And since uh, militarized masculinity is associated with excessive risk taking, if we work on these attitudes and take this into account uh, when recruiting people and so on, we would reasonably uh, reduce uh, accidents and uh, mistakes related to excessive risk taking. And likewise, we should be able to reduce problems with psychological unhealth, for example, suicide, perhaps related to traumatic experience uh, during military service. So making it easier to talk about uh, such things. Next slide, please. And of course, since uh, militarized masculinity is associated with, with uh, uh, rape and other forms of uh, sexual violence against women and so on, Having fewer people in an organization with such attitudes should reduce sexual harassment, but also hazing and other uh, problems that tend to hold women back, especially in, in the military, uh, but also uh, other uh, groups that traditionally are underrepresented. Uh, and hence, it would be possible to widen the recruitment pool and have more competent applicants for each opening in such an organization. So it also has implications for 
the capacity to recruit and retain qualified personnel. Next slide, please. And finally, um, research shows that these traditional old uh, militarized masculinity ideals are increasingly out of sync with most people in developed countries. And of course, the armed forces uh, want to be popular, uh, want to have a, a large budget and um, generally uh, understanding from the population it serves. And uh, this is then uh, uh, also an aspect which is relevant to consider. Next slide, please. But one may ask when, when discussing these things, uh, if the old traditional way of creating a, a military and making warriors, if that's not good, uh, what should come instead? And specifically what warrior ideals uh, should come instead in a modern uh, progressive uh, society? If we need warriors, for example, if our democratically elected parliament has decided that we need a military defense, how do we recruit and train uh, warriors for that defense? Um, and uh, I would argue then that, that we, we need to uh, keep some of the values, of course, that uh, are celebrated in this traditional warrior identity, which uh, is uh, associated with maleness and masculinity. So soldiers need to be brave, uh, but not, uh, uh, not uh, excessively risk-taking or excessively aggressive. Soldiers need to be uh, uh, need to be prepared to sacrifice and withstand hard hardships. Uh, they need to be tough. So these things need to be preserved in a modern military organization and also uh, perhaps uh, in organi similar organizations like uh, the police and the uh, security guard organizations. But these things. Uh, are not and should not be viewed as male things. So I think that is the key to move on from these, uh, all the negative baggage that uh, comes with uh, uh, militarized masculinity. Uh, the, these uh, warrior qualities that we want to promote uh, should be delinked from masculinity. I think that's the key moving forward. Otherwise we will have these uh, ideas about uh, men being entitled to uh, dominate others uh, and to privileges uh, because they are warriors and they are the only ones that can be real warriors. Next slide, please. And my final slide. Um, so uh, given this analysis, where to from, from here? Um, here you can see uh, several recruitment posters from the Swedish Armed Forces from recent years. And uh, they um, uh, clearly want to signal that uh, the Swedish Armed Forces nowadays uh, is a tolerant organization, which is open to anyone, uh, regardless of gender or, or sexual orientation, uh, and also ethnic background and so on. Uh, the only thing that matters is your competency, how suitable you are for the position you are applying to. Um, and they, I think th these uh, ads and campaigns are uh, very skillfully uh, developed, uh, I would say. Uh, they really convey this message uh, in an effective way. But it is very interesting also to note uh, reactions, uh, counter reactions uh, and the backlash against these campaigns and also against in general about uh, against the, uh, the work in the military to, to uh, work on attitudes and values and all that. Um, especially in social media where people complain about um, things like wokeness or uh, the military engaging in virtue signaling or um, recruiting snowflakes uh, instead of real soldiers. So these ideals about militarized masculinity are clearly uh, alive, um, at least among people who uh, uh, complain and, and uh, write about these things uh, in social media. I get the impression that many of them are maybe older guys, like people in, of my age who did their military service uh, during the Cold War and now they don't recognize themselves in, in the modern armed forces. 
um, but um, it is a problem and uh, um, I don't know where uh, where we will go from here whether um, there will be a backlash or whether the armed forces can continue to uh, distance itself from uh, these uh, harmful forms of masculinity and warrior ideals. That's the end of my presentation. Thanks. Thank you so much, Eric. That was a uh, masterful overview, which I think uh, will ring true to many of us from what we know, both of popular culture, uh, military culture and the debate that's going on. So thank you so much. And it's exciting research that you point to. Um, <clears throat> just thought I'd mention uh, before we continue that we will try to have a Q&A towards the end. But because we are many people in the seminar, in order to do it efficiently, the best way to do it is to write your comment or question in the chat function in Teams. Uh, and uh, we may not get to all questions, but uh, we will try to. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to say a big thank you before we continue, because there are several people that you don't actually see here that make this uh, seminar actually happen. Uh, and a special thanks to Toyota and uh, Kelly who have uh, put this together so masterfully. So thanks to you. We'll now move on to the next presentation, which is by my good colleague, Luis Ulsson, who is a senior researcher at CREO and the former senior advisor on women, peace and security at the Folkebanalotte Academy in Sweden. She currently leads a research project which seeks to improve our understanding of factors that affect the Norwegian Armed Forces deployment of women personnel to military operations. It's a project which is part of an international collaboration led by the Geneva Center for Security and Sector Governance and Cornell University. She also works with Chiara Rufa, Erik Melander, whom we just heard, and Sara Lindberg Bromley at Uppsala University on a project focusing on the retention of women military personnel in the Swedish Armed Forces. In addition to research, uh, Louise contributes regularly to military training on gender, both at the Nordic Center uh, for Gender in Military Operations and in the Swedish Gender Coach Program, which is a training program for senior leaders in the Swedish Armed Forces. So she is uh, definitely very well equipped to comment on today's uh, topic. And not least, uh, during these Nobel days, it's great to see someone who has this Norway-Sweden crossover, so couldn't be better. Mm -hmm. Louise will speak about gender equality efforts in the Norwegian and Swedish Armed Forces. Uh, Louise, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you, Henrik, uh, for that uh, introduction and uh, thank you, Eric, for a really interesting uh, presentation. Uh, as uh, Henrik said, I will base my comments on observation from the ongoing project uh, mentioned. Uh, and also I'll try to bring up some questions and, and issues uh, in an attempt to, I think, bridge uh, Eric's really interesting research presentation with the really interesting presentation we will hear about the ongoing practical work in the Norwegian Armed Forces. In terms of, of positioning myself, maybe I should also add, just like Eric, that I'm also very supportive of ongoing processes for gender equality, and I think it's a, a really important, but also probably quite difficult uh, process ahead. So let me start with making a first, uh, uh, just one first sort of initial reflection. And, and that is in my PhD project, I sought to understand the gendered effects of peacekeeping in terms of how operations affected male and female uh, gender roles and also risks and access to power for women and men in the host, uh, uh, post-war host state. Uh, and I, at that time, I found it was quite easy to get interviews to discuss uh, female situations, risks and roles. Many were very, very well prepared to talk about that. But when I asked the same kind of interview questions, but focusing on uh, male roles and masculinity, I often got the response, why do you ask about men? I thought that you were focusing on gender. So just like Eric, I think it's important to sort of that in this conversation, bridging research and policy also, we, we recognize that we're still striving to get away from this idea that gender equals women in many contexts. Uh, and this is despite the fact that both in research and in policy experiences, uh, we know that gender constructions are about ideals and relations and, and, and power and status. Um, so, but even though we, we, we have that sort of general knowledge, when we look at gender equality and equal opportunity policies for security institutions today, these still often tend to remain quite silent on the varying norms and ideals about masculinities and male roles and what effects that these potentially can have in the organization's gender equality efforts. Uh, and I think that as Eric has highlighted, this sort of nuanced approach to understanding the, the ideals and also perhaps 
perceptions and narratives that the people can have that come into the military and how the organization can work with dealing with those kinds of norms and expectations could really, I think, contribute to the, the really strong ongoing processes on gender equality and inclusion in both the Norwegian and the Swedish armed forces. Now, naturally, of course, change takes time. I think that's an argument that we often hear, uh, all of us. Uh, but that said, uh, the Swedish Armed Forces has today 8% women military officers, uh, uh, at least by 2020. So if we take the perspective of this event, that means that it has a 92% male domination of the officers' corps after 41 years of gender equality work. Now, Norway has an even longer time period where they have tried to improve the balance in Presley starting already in 1976. And the Norwegian Armed Forces now report that it has used uh, around 200 different kinds of, of tools and measures on gender equality to try to come to terms uh, and improve uh, inclusion. And the male dominance of the officers' corps today uh, is around 89%. A more substantive change is that Norway now reports that uh, this year, 33% impressively of all conscripts are women. That said, attitude service in both countries still display that discrimination by sex remains a core problem. So this idea that exists in, in some context that just because Norway and Sweden are gender equal countries, it means that all uh, labor markets are equal doesn't seem to pan out uh, as regards to the military. So uh, I think that uh, uh, it, it's very apparent that these really strong efforts taken at the at the very senior leadership levels in the militaries in both countries, leaders there still appear to be up against quite substantial challenges and progress is slow. And this is also puzzling because many in the organizations are also willing to work for change. So I think that what Eric's sort of research really point out is some of the really structural and, and really large uh, substantive challenges that still uh, remain and perhaps also that uh, using the keys of masculinities and, and these ideals can open up for, for a more uh, in-depth discussion of what these challenges can look like. So let me therefore raise two points uh, with some questions for the panel discussion, sort of trying to, to bridge this uh, that comes from the two projects uh, mentioned. So the first project uh, point is based in the project seeking to understand factors that affect the Norwegian Armed Forces deployment of women personnel to international military operations. So this project is one component of an international effort to improve the number of uh, women in, in uh, operations by expanding and systematizing the knowledge foundation. So UN and NATO have had objectives and targets on increasing number of women personnel for as long as I've worked. I think some of the first came uh, already in the 1990s. However, uh, change has been very, very slow. So now there's an increased policy push in nationally and internationally to, to, to make some kind of change. And I think also it's important to know here how much interest there is in Norway's efforts in this area, since it's one of the most gender equal countries in the world and also now part of the UN Security Council, which adopted a resolution on this theme later uh, uh, last year. So what this project does is that it draws on international methodology, the measuring opportunities for women in peace operations, uh, the MOVIP methodology developed by Sabrina Karim and, and DCAF. Uh, and it's simultaneously carried out in several countries. So that makes the results possible to compare uh, between states and therefore also possible to uh, improve or facilitate the exchange of lessons learned between countries. So what the project does is try to assess different 10 different kinds of issue area that we know can affect inclusion, such as recruitment and criteria of selection, access to equipment, family policies and roles, gender culture, exclusion and harassment, and also the important role of leadership for change. Now we know that in all these 10 issue areas, gender and masculinity can play a critical role. So it's an attempt to take this 360 degree evaluation of all uh, different kinds of factors that can exist. And I think that they also sort of in a sense underline the kind of challenges that we're up against if we're going to, to use tools on masculinities and, and uh, to come to terms with and improve inclusion. Uh, so what this project also does is sort of, uh, and as Eric was uh, mentioning in the beginning, is that it makes increasing use of, of statistics and substantive surveys. Uh, so 
I think a critical question for us to discuss here is how can we even more pointedly use gender disaggregated data and, and develop the use of sex disaggregated data and also use surveys directed at, at different segments in society and also compare different experiences of men and women personnel uh, and how this can then be even more strategically pointed uh, used uh, uh, to come to terms with the dimensions of masculinity. Uh, and here I would really like to know and, and hear Eric's and Michael's reflections on, on what kind of tools can we develop uh, to, to, to bring this dialogue and, and to bring up these issues uh, even more pointedly, because as I think as Eric has highlighted, it really goes to core, very sometimes quite emotional ideals that, that, that you need good tools to address. Uh, I also think that sort of as we use uh, gender disaggregated data and, and surveys directed at both men and men, it, it's also possible to identify which that that affects gender equality. I, I think that uh, a counter argument that many of us here, when we have identified one critical area that, that could affect the inclusion and in career of women, uh, is that well, similar kinds of, of uh, uh, the, the same kind of factor would also negatively affect men. Well, if you actually compare and, and make this comparative uh, survey, you can actually then try to weed out. So what, what are the factors that uh, have similarities and variations uh, in, in terms of how they affect men and women? So my first question is therefore sort of how do we develop, as I said, the use of disaggregated data and, and also how can it be, uh, how is it used today and, and how can we be further developed to also capture these masculinity aspects. I know that Eric has really interesting survey uh, uh, tools, for example, that, that can assess these different components. So it would be really interesting to hear more about that. Uh, and I would also, from Michael, be really interested to hear, considering the, the Swedish-Norwegian comparison here, what does the cooperation and, and dialogue between Nordic countries look like in, in the ongoing efforts on inclusion and gender equality? Because there are many different kinds of similarities and differences that, that are, uh, I think, probably quite telling in getting to terms with some of these uh, problems. The second point relate to the project on retention of women personnel. So here I want to bring up a result that PI Kiara Ruffa and her colleagues have also found that speak to how masculinity can play a role in socialization processes relating to the formation of uh, subcultures uh, that can form within the organization. And these subcultures can then develop ideals and norms that differ from the values and ideals set by the organization on the strategic level. So even if the strategic level sets this idea for the new modern uh, military uh, that is more inclusive and that very much more task oriented. Uh, there can still be subcultures which, which have a, a, a different kinds of formulation of the of masculinity and warrior identities. And these could then, of course, potentially affect uh, gender equality efforts in organization over time. And this result comes, I would say, from a Nordic, non-Nordic environment, but I think it still captures really interesting key questions. So what she found was that going into an officer training program, male and female attitudes and norms did not differ substantially. However, even though the program offered a uniform way of training on norms and rules, many of the male officers still gravitated towards the subculture based on a narrative of an ideal military of officer that had more sort of the, the tones of a more negative masculine ideals that, that Eric uh, is pointing to. And this subculture form particularly related to sort of how men in the program related to and position themselves in relation to each other. Uh, and this change in male attitudes differed from the stated value foundation of the organization. And it also tended to contribute potentially to exclude women from certain potential networks or career paths in the military. Uh, in comparison, the women officers actually moved in more in the direction of the norms and attitudes that were set by the military organization as, as the core ideals. So if subcultures are important, this means that the um, the culture, of course, in the organization, military organization is not uniform and, and we can, uh, from a, a research perspective, it also means that it's actually possible to better compare variations in, in norms and attitudes and how that affects success uh, in terms of creating equal opportunities and moving forward. And I think also from a policy perspective, it's really, really important, has been brought up in many conversations that we also need to look at the success rate of some of these many gender equality uh, efforts that have been made in order to not only focus on the, the negative dynamics, but also where change is, pro is possible and what it is that creates progress. 
And I think that Norway and Sweden has tried many of these different tools, so it would be really interesting here also to have a, a comparison and a dialogue of, of how what has succeeded or not. So for because, for example, female conscripts in Sweden, they actually report on average that they are more content with their basic training than the men, and they are also willing to recommend this training to, to others. Uh, and they also see this training as a good opportunity for personal development. Um, so it, it's clear that it's not a, a uniform sort of negative culture. It, it's very apparent that some areas are succeeding. Um, and I also think this also illustrates that uh, as, as in, it's becoming more and more part of the retention debate that the military, of course, is an organization where you build your career over time. So what does Eric's presentation and Chiara's result tell us about the critical phases in the career and arenas then to consider where subcultures can uh, develop uh, and uh, what are the sort of the critical things to consider when you generate the next generation of officers and the effect uh, that that can have on gender equality over time as they are then to, to take over uh, these uh, ongoing efforts. Uh, I sometimes hear that gender equality and inequality will be resolved by these modern values when the coming generation come in, but I think the Chiara's results really would caution us to sort of over rely uh, on, on, a, sort of a, a, on a change over time happening uh, without work. And I think that feminist research is really hesitant even to the idea of introducing women and that that would sort of change the patriarchal uh, institution. And in a more, uh, in, in research to come from a more comparative perspective, Karim and Beersley have also found that just introducing women into a male dominated organization isn't sufficient. It requires work with both culture and environment in order to create a more equal opportunity workplace. And I think that Eric's uh, point about the core ideas that they can really affect uh, uh, these kind of shifts uh, really speak to how, how in depth these can go. Uh, so I think finally also that since we're in the Nordic country in a really formative phase where we go from the national security to total defense, I think it's also important and interesting to hear the reflections on what this could mean for uh, in, in this particular uh, phase going uh, forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louise. These are uh, crucial questions and they play right into the competences of the two other participants that we have today. So we should have a fascinating conversation between the three of you during our last uh, approximately 25 minutes. And we'll also try to bring in some of the questions that come in from the outside. Please use the chat function. We already have an interesting question brought in there. But first, our final presentation. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Mikhail Bas botnik hartmann has his background from the Air Defense Artillery and has been assigned to command positions at all levels under uh, until his last assignment as the Executive Officer and Chief of Staff at the 132nd Air Wing which is the home unit of one third of the active duty personnel in the Royal Norwegian Air Force and the home base for the new F-35 fighter aircraft. But that's another seminar on those aircraft. He is currently assigned to the Norwegian Defense Staff as a project officer working on the prevention of bullying, harassment and sexual harassment in the armed forces. He is responsible for diversity management in the armed forces uh, and could uh, not be a better speaker for uh, our uh, seminar today. He is a graduate of the German Command and Staff College and has served in Afghanistan. He will provide us with both a personal and institutional perspective based on years of experience with this topic. Uh, please, uh, Mikhail, the uh, floor and the screen is all yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, Luis, thank you for the bridging. Um, First of all, uh, looking at uh, the balance of women, women in, your, uh, in the armed forces in Norway, there is no doubt that we have failed. You mentioned the 200 uh, different things we've been trying to do uh, for years. I think one of the biggest issues, and I'm going to uh, come back to that, uh, has to do with leadership and management. We haven't been able to manage these efforts. Uh, they have come up from political whims or in, uh, local initiatives but they have not been systemized and uh, and measured over time. And not necessarily, they have not necessarily been research-based either. Uh, first of all, uh, Melander was talking about uh, how we portray the armed forces. Uh, there is no doubt that we have a challenge portraying a perspective of the armed forces today that they, not necessarily, they won't necessarily meet when they meet uh, for service. 
Uh, this has also been addressed by my good colleague. I see the present here today, uh, Lena Koiving. Uh, and I've taken the ball, uh, picked up the ball, and I'm running, uh, running with it right now because this is actually one of the uh, greatest efforts we have portraying this uh, uh, soft value organization outside, but still uh, we have this masculine uh, heritage that we're still struggling with, most definitely. Uh, and I've been a part of this myself for 25 years, but I've also been lucky enough to see uh, a positive development. And yes, it said that it, it's it said that it's going to take time and it's uh, about changing culture. But no, I would argue that it doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to take that much time. Uh, I think we got a gift a few years ago when compulsory ser uh, service conscription was made mandatory for both men and women. This is a great opportunity for us. Uh, first and foremost, because we mostly recruit per our personnel through uh, conscription, uh, either as specialists or they apply for the officer's education in the armed forces. A very few, uh, very uh, few percentage uh, of the applicants for your officer's education come right off the street. But approximately 90% of them has already served. And uh, I wanna go back in time to 2014, uh, before we had mandatory uh, service for men and women. Uh, my old unit was part of an experiment uh, so-called 50-50 project. The 50-50 uh, project was about having 50% men and 50% women amongst the conscripts. In addition to that, uh, they were put in mixed rooms. And for the operational value of that, what was what actually uh, seemed to happen is that, uh, and that un uh, underlines what uh, Melander also said, is that we, uh, when measuring uh, the operational effect uh, through a yearly evaluation, standard ev evaluation done in the unit uh, from external uh, resources, we saw that we actually had the same or better proficiency level than before. And the unit cohesion was better. And we also saw that we had less disciplinary uh, action uh, to be taken. Uh, less disciplinary issues within the unit, and uh, hence a lower rate of harassment, sexual harassment, uh, and it was the unit was uh, able to self-regulate uh, uh, potential issues that would have become issues over time in a better way. So I would argue that the uh, the best solution would be to get more uh, or uh, more equal balance of men and women in total. But that takes time, of course. But it is possible. We can do things. Uh, and just to, to finalize that argue, uh, argument, uh, I uh, also see that a lot of the, uh, the women uh, who took part in that project in 2014 is still present in the unit, working in the unit today. And the other thing is that uh, the, the we have started we started off really uh, bad with this equal opportunity. Like in a so historical perspective, we've been talking about equal opportunities and focus on the women part. Research showed that uh, that the the uh, one sided focus actually had a counterproductive effect. Uh, uh, making the women uh, questioning their themselves and their um, uh, their place in the armed forces. Uh, and as things developed, we were, we started talking more about diversity. Uh, as I took uh, part of the, uh, as I studied at the German Defen uh, Command Staff College, I uh, wrote my thesis on uh, diversity. And it became clear to me that uh, as we, we are as an as a nation, I think we're complacent. We take these things for given, so we haven't really been systemizing the uh, the process uh, or managing uh, diversity until the latter few years. Uh, whereas nations who have knew that and appreciated their, their challenges have come much further in 
the systemization and the managing of diversity or diversity management that we had. But we're getting there slowly uh, because uh, still, I, and I meet, meet my when I meet my colleagues, we're still talking about the outer traits when we're talking about the visible traits when we're talking about diversity, sex, uh, experience, uh, sexual orientation, whatnot, uh, ethnicity, ethnicity. But for us, as an uh, as an value based institute institution, at a fairly small uh, unit or uh, armed forces, we need to be able to recruit the best men, women, uh, men and women, in order to, and they need to be feel accepted. They need to be able to be themselves in order to be the most effective they can be. Uh, to put that in perspective, when I started, I, uh, I started the platoon level and we had 40 people in the platoon and I'm not proud to say this, this but about uh, out of the, those 40 people, 10 of them might not work. So when the evaluators, uh, external evaluators came into uh, to, to my field positions, I would, I, I actually stole a few of them away. So I didn't, uh, I knew they would work. But still, the unit uh, worked uh, when being evaluated. Then I came back a few uh, a few years later with new systems, new technology, uh, and I realized that I don't know anything. I'm I'm actually uh, dependent on each and every individual in order to make the system work, and no one can take over. We're actually dependent on everyone all the time and they need to feel comfortable being there. They need to be respected, accepted, uh, and uh, not only tolerated uh, for who they are. Uh, I have, uh, I could talk about this for months, uh, hours and hours. But back to, the, uh, to leadership, there is uh, an obvious uh, leadership responsibility here. And the leaders need to own up to their responsibility, including myself, uh, in order to actually uh, look at how do we handle uh, what we perceive and agree upon that is not a healthy culture to actually accomplish the mission we're, uh, we're given. Uh, and I see that a lot of people don't understand really, it's not about incompetence uh it's about lack of competence and a willing to listen to this but if we manage to connect these topics to our core values uh, and they say it seem uh, might uh, quite masculine in itself when i talk about them respect responsibility and courage these three words represent the uh stated core values of the norwegian armed forces if we manage to Connect, I believe the solution uh, lies in uh, connecting these topics, these soft skill values, uh, so to say, to these core values and see uh, and make people see that this actually has an operational effect. We're going to be more effective. We're going to be much better than our, than our opponent. And we have to be because we are limited by the resources we have. We cannot afford spending a lot of uh, resources, uh, 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 the money we do on what we do and not be effective about it. And the other thing is that, uh, if, uh, and the last thing I want to address is retention. You talked, uh, since Luis brought it up. Yeah, retention is an issue. Uh, we see uh, a lot, if you, if you look at a broader scope, we have a lower, actually have a lower retention uh, in the armed forces than in uh, other governmental agencies, uh, interestingly enough. But our big problem is that when we lose personnel mid-career, there is no quick fix. We can't just walk out on the street and put someone else in that same position. We'll have to start from the bottom and educate until we have uh, edu educate them until we have them in the same position. And they, that takes 10, 15, 20 years. At the same time, looking at why people leave the armed forces, uh, and there was a survey last year done by the Norwegian Defense and Research Institute. There aren't actually that many differences to why men and women uh, leave uh, the armed forces. Uh, the percentage rate is actually quite equal to the reasons. But the problem is that since we have so few women uh, at that level, 
uh, it's more visible. And until we manage to actually, uh, and that has to do, I believe, that has to do with our patriarchal culture uh, still being systemized through, uh, through our regulations. So how, how should a career uh, be running? What should you do in order to get the next position and so forth? And if you're uh, if you're not in streamlined into that, and or for instance, you have other values or uh, one uh, prioritize uh, in other ways throughout your career, uh, you're not part of that, and your career stops, and that makes people leave. And that is actually uh, one of our main focuses right now, looking at regulation and how 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 career opportunities should be given, but make no mistake this happens to men as well they also leave because uh they have chosen to prioritize family or uh, didn't find that work life balance was uh, uh sufficient so they left for the same reasons but obviously not as visible and the other thing is that we have a um, demographic issue coming up right now in the five to six years when the uh, 50 plus generation uh, goes into retirement my generation uh, mid 40s uh, we will be uh, too few to actually man all the needed positions and that is an issue right now and then we need to keep the personnel we have but first and foremost we need them all uh, people in order to actually be the best we can be and solve the mission in the best way possible with the limited resources we have and actually be proud of uh, of the core values we have and identify with them and i believe that actually a lot of men a lot of women as well identify with the core values we have but we need to get them inside before we actually get get them further on in the system i think i'll stop there uh, and wait for a quick q a thank you Thank you so much, Mikhail. This is a fascinating seminar in so many ways. Uh, some, of course, of uh, those following PREO and PEACE research uh, would say that it's also fascinating to see this dialogue between uh, PEACE research on the one hand and how we man or woman, if that could be a verb, uh, the armed forces uh, and how the armed forces can live up to values that all of society can gather around. So there are many very interesting fault lines here and not least excellent presentations. So thanks warmly to all three of you. We have the time until 10 o'clock, so I hope most of you will stay on. I, I hope you notice that one of the main topics of the seminar is retention. And we also try to uh, high, keep high retention in our in our seminars because these are uh, fascinating questions. What I'd like to do first is to give each of you in the panel a chance to respond briefly to each other. And I won't ask any particular question because it may be different things that you want to comment on and simply give Eric first, then Luis, and then Mikhail, if you would add, like to add anything, uh, a, a chance to respond. Then I have a really interesting question on the chat that I would like to you also to comment on, and there may be more coming in. Please use the chat if you'd like to comment, but I'll leave it open like that for now and give the floor uh, to you, Eric. Thank you. OK, I'll briefly then first comment on the other presentations, which I found very interesting and useful. Um, my um, my reflections on tools and what to do and so on um, would be the following. And this is not based on a lot of experience or research on this, but just from thinking and listening and reading a lot about this. Um, I think role models um, are key, um, and in Sweden at least, I think at the very highest levels, uh, most um, most of the people who are visible there are excellent role models in this regard. But maybe a middle level and lower levels, maybe the middle level would be uh, key for for uh, moving on. Um, my impression is also that at the very lowest level, uh, people tend to be so young and. Uh, come in from, from society, the very modern, most modern version of society, that they tend to have different attitudes, I think, that the, these uh, things that we talk about now are natural for many of them. Um, so maybe, maybe it would be the kind of the middle level uh, role models that uh, need work now, at least in the Swedish context. Another thing I think that is necessary is, and this relates a little bit to the difficult and the important question in the chat, but I think that the armed forces must celebrate um, warriors. 
uh, and show what what uh, um, the warrior function is about. People um, training for for fighting and using weapons uh, under difficult conditions and so on. And I, uh, that's also an impression I have from from talking to a lot of people in the armed forces and from following debates on on social media and so on. That if people who are interested or in in these things or are working in, in these organizations, if they don't recognize themselves in what is shown, um, and if they cannot feel proud of um, what they are doing, then uh, they will dismiss or not like uh, the message, of course. And soldiers want want to to uh, feel that being a soldier and be doing soldierly things um, is appreciated and is important. Um, and the Swedish armed forces have been criticized a little bit for this, showing, for example, uh, putting a lot of emphasis on, yeah, you know, the armed forces help out when there is a forest fire and when somebody gets lost picking berries, the soldiers will come and help look for them. But in more recent years, I think they have changed the tone a little bit and showing much more, you know, the use of weapons and uh, soldiers being uh, dirty and hungry and, and uh, tired and, and all that. And the soldiers like that and people who, so I think it, it, it's necessary to show that in order to, to recruit people at the same time as th this message about um, tolerance and openness uh, for difference is uh, promoted. Um, and then I think about the warrior ideals. I think the military and civil organizations need to find um, ideals to celebrate, which are not about you know domination or killing or or imposing one's will by force, like uh, um, uh, or even racism, like in a Swedish booklet for conscripts from 1930s. It was stated that one of the strongest assets of the Swedish nation is our pure race. Of course, that kind of crap is not what is uh, motivating soldiers today, but finding other things, other ideals that have to do with, with soldierly skills and, and competition, maybe friendship, um, the friendship among soldiers, and the ability to provide mutual support uh, in contrast to this idea that uh, warriors shouldn't show weakness. Uh, it's actually the opposite. Uh, warriors need to support each other also emotionally. Things like that. And then just briefly with regard to, to the research, there's so much we could talk about here. And I think much more research is needed. And a lot of the findings that I mentioned do not pertain uh, specifically to, to the military, but to people in general. Um, so yeah, I'll, I think I'll not say more right now on research, but I have many ideas and thoughts about research. And then the question in the chat, maybe I can come back to later as well. Thank you. We'll come back to that towards the end. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Eric. I'd like to uh, give you a chance to respond, uh, Luis. Well, thank you, and and uh, thank you for uh, a really interesting um, insights, Michael. Also on, on the ongoing efforts and the and the challenges uh, that uh, uh, exist, and and um, I, I would actually like to to tie back to to some of the things you said and, and perhaps even um, raise some more questions there and it goes to the question of tools because i think it's it's what's interesting to me uh, when you look at sort of the discussion around the military profession and and sort of it's a fairly standardized and sort of really sort of really quite clearly communicated ideal and, and i think maybe that can also be a strength in terms of how can you find tools and a dialogue that can open up for for discussing the, the military profession. And the, and the tricky question I think that Eric raises in terms of, of how these ideals are, are perceived and are, are some of these dynamics sort of at the, at the foundation still of, of the military profession, or how can you get at that in a way that that finds, as you say, Michael, the this interesting, rewarding, and developing for the organization to, to continue to grow with as a, as a tool for continued uh, growth and also something that, that can say something about the uh, the situation and I think maybe military training and, and if you could reflect also on, on how how you deal with uh, the aspects that I think Eric uh, also uh, sort of indicate in a sense that uh, there are some studies or arguments at least that suggest that the military tend to uh, on average of course you, you have very strong criteria in terms of the, the majority that is selected but you tend to maybe potentially 
attract the interest of men who, who perhaps align more with the traditional masculine or, or militarized masculine ideals. So, so they find the, the military interesting. At the same time, you also attract uh, women who wants to do something new, who wants to break the gender roles, who don't agree with traditional gender roles and, and, and uh, the, the way that the hierarchies are constructed. So you, you might end up in training with, with groups with very different perspectives on, on me the military and, and the military profession. Uh, and also perhaps in terms of, if you look at some of the attitudes, so for women going into the military, uh, we know that gender equality is one of the of the core values that they they really perceive that that the military should uh, uphold. So so what does this mean for for military training? If we take these ideas around masculinity into to training uh, sessions, thank you. Thank you. First, uh, I'll just uh, add very briefly there before Mikhail continues that one of these things that are being discussed uh, when it comes to the exact communication of roles is this whole term warrior, uh, which Eric interestingly brought into the picture. And there's quite a heated debate within military ethics about the role of that term, whether it's actually a positive term or a term that can be filled with different content or whether it is an outdated term, which signals uh, things that we don't really want to signal that much. And it's back to the whole question of competence, what an armed force is and so on. So I think that is really fascinating. Uh, we had two questions in the chat, but before we get to them, I'll uh, I'll give you the floor, uh, Mikael, to comment on not least what uh, Luis just asked you, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, great presentations. Uh, and me being here is not much for uh, giving me the ability to talk about what I do. But uh, first and foremost, I get inspiration for the for work I have to do uh, regarding this topic. And hopefully I'll have more colleagues working with that uh, in a short while. It's, uh, we have a new uh, uh, diversity advisor coming on uh, in a short while. But uh, I would like to answer the last part of the question first, because um, we do a lot of good things when it comes to training uh, and the training is actually uh, an education uh, is actually focused on the emotional level, individual emotional level and how people interact and communicate in order to make the be best effort. That is uh, both in the officers training and also in the specialist training and the NCO uh, training has a fairly large focus, although it could be uh, more. But instead of uh, coming up with new things, uh, bringing back the example of the project I'm working on, uh, we had a, a survey in 2018 that showed us really dark numbers when it came to sexual harassment and violence as well within the armed forces uh, in a relative perspective. Uh, one started off uh, with making that that's this something else uh, and starting off a campaign working on specifically on sexual harassment, uh, harassment or bullying. But what actually happened uh, uh, was that people uh, took distance from it. We had external resources into this work uh, uh, because these things are just a symptom of something else that doesn't work. And if we can connect that to what we know uh, work and we know what people identify themselves, uh, meaning our core values, we seem to have more success. So we're uh, quite excited to see how the next survey being conducted next year will uh, pan out. Um, and when it comes to the, uh, the, the ability to uh, systemize and actually, well, run things, things through the organizations, back again to leadership. Uh, if the leader won't sign off on the uh, document or a procedure or whatever, nothing will happen. Then we can work on all levels uh, with the best intentions, but we will not be given the necessary resources to do it. We need a clear leadership at all levels. Uh, and when I talk about uh, clear leadership, I don't mean just mean people that take some some product and present it to their subordinates. I mean people who live and breathe these things and really mean it. Those those people going up front is standing in front of the, uh, in the front line. Uh, we need those people, and that is probably key to success. So thank you. 
Well, thank you very much, Mikael. And I think it's fascinating what you say about leadership because you also emphasized earlier in your fine presentation the way in which uh, this also moves bottom up. It's also the way in which this culture is accepted at the lower levels of the hierarchy. So this is, uh, you know, uh, top down and bottom up at the same time, I think, uh, in an interesting way. Uh, we have three questions that I'd like to spend our last 10 minutes on, and I'll address the first one to Eric. It's from Kathleen Jennings, and it's a question on uh, the research variables. And I'm sure you had a chance to, to have a brief look at it. Um, it's, she thanks you for an interesting presentation, which we all do, but asks, uh, what exactly does effectiveness in war mean uh, when you say that a uh, gender equal military or alternatively a gender equal state that has a military is more effective? She also asks about the relationship between gender equal states and gender equal militaries, but we can concentrate on that. Uh, what are the main variables uh, that you would use in your research uh, to talk about effectiveness? Three minutes for you, and then we have three minutes for each of the other questions, Sue, please. Thank you. Yeah, let me just first recognize that I see the dilemma here that um, as a peace researcher, uh, am I studying how to kill people the most efficiently? Uh, and uh, are we talking about ways of uh, including women in the armed forces so that the armed forces can become better at killing people and women perhaps maybe even more exploited? I see those risks and, and uh, historically the armed forces have been uh, in most societies uh, perhaps the greatest threat to, to the inhabitants of that society. Uh, but I think also that, that uh, I mean, I said in the beginning that I'm very positive to the Swedish Armed Forces and I'm a proud member of the Home Guard uh, and we have a democratically elected parliament that has decided that we need the military defense. But I recognize that these are difficult, complex questions. So what I looked at in this preliminary study is uh, a measure of how many battlefield uh, casualties that uh, a state inflicts on its opponent uh, compared to how many casualties the state suffers. So for example, um, looking at Finland in the Second World War fighting against the Soviet Union, the Finnish side, and now you can hear how absurd this may sound from the point of view of peace research, but the Finnish side killed five times as many Soviet soldiers compared to uh, its own losses. So the Finnish armed forces were uh, extremely efficient in the Second World War. Maybe they lost the war, or the Finns would say that they came in second place, but they maintained their independence. So that's an example of a more gender equal society being much more efficient than a less gender equal society. And it doesn't imply that uh, the armed forces themselves were more gender equal. So what are the explanations? I think it, this has to do with, uh, um, as was also mentioned in the chat, selecting which wars to fight better, uh, not fighting wars that are risky and for glory, but fighting only those wars that are winnable and uh, essential. And also a broader recruitment pool, which means that uh, the resources in society are better mobilized. And finally, a more open and dynamic uh, culture, thinking um, in a more open way and being open to criticism uh, and developing um, ideas in a way which more gender uh, unequal states tend to be to a lesser degree. And they also tend to be more authoritarian. So yeah, I should stop there. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Those, those are uh, interesting reflections on an important uh, research topic. Uh, Mikhail, there's a question for you as well, which is also from Kathleen and, uh, and I think quite poignant, which uh, asks about the relationship between gender work on the one hand and broader diversity work on the other. Is there a danger that these can get in the way of each other, work against each other, because there are other diversity perspectives than, than gender and maybe some that are coming to the fore now. And she also adds, even though you don't have to comment on that, uh, the question of uh, the social strata of society coming into an organization like the military, for instance, is the concern that middle class young men and women with high educational extracurricular performance are edging out uh, working class uh, youth have traditionally had the military as an arena. Uh, but that's that's an interesting observation for the three minutes. You can uh, talk about exactly what you want to uh, when it comes to this relationship between gender on the one hand and broader diversity work on the other. Uh, please, Mikael. Thank you. Uh, 
from a personal point of view, point of view I don't see that there is conflict in that work. Uh, but I do believe, I tend to see, say that, uh, like I also mentioned, if you focus too much on one thing, you will uh, put up a stigma. Uh, and it might work. Uh, uh, you'll you'll have, get the opposite effect of what you want. But people want to be people. People want to be respected and accepted for who they are. Uh, my, uh, I believe uh, not because, and we don't. Uh, we don't need uh, gay people because they're gay. That is not a resource in itself. It's the person, not the expression, that is the important resource for us. Uh, and and uh, but uh, to some extent, it could actually have an operational effect uh, to have someone with a certain ethnicity or a certain sex uh, within a certain uh, confined uh, frame uh, in the oper theater operations. But first and foremost, I, th I believe we should focus on the, the broad diversity but at the same time, work on the equal rights perspective. Uh, although uh, that is also a indiv an individual choice. Do you want to take part of this uh, masculine culture and patriarchal uh, culture that we still have? And we see that, of course, that women and men as well tend to uh, leave the armed forces just because, uh, because of those things, as I mentioned. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think I'll stop there uh, for the last for the last part of the question. Yes, uh, we we have uh, an issue, and that is also why diversity, uh, a broader sense of diversity, is important for me because we select uh, the top uh, class. Uh, we select from the top of each class every year, uh, and we also have so many underlying demands that a lot of people. Are not allowed to meet for service because of uh, yeah, it could be uh, political and not political uh, international relations it could be physical things and so forth so we absolutely need to get people to be the best they can be in, within the armed forces to get the best mo uh, most out of them yeah thank you thank you this is interesting and touches on so many questions in in society indeed so thank you for those comments. I'll just mention the two last comments that I have received on, on the chat here from two good colleagues. I'll uh, mention both of them and let the, the last one be a challenge for you, uh, Luis, to comment on. But first, I'll, I'll mention from Pinar uh, uh, the link between masculinity ideals in state identity and on the, the other hand, mi militarized masculinity in the organization. And as he points out, it might be easier to address militarized masculinity in the Norwegian or Swedish context than for instance in the Russian or Turkish context. And I think we have a topic for another seminar right there, how we speak about these things and what sort of societal basis there is for that. So thank you, uh, Pinar. And finally from Turun, who opened our seminar today, uh, he talks about the issue of motivating people to join military forces, engage in fighting, and of course, uh, traditionally protection of the vulnerable, of the weak has been at the core uh, throughout the centuries. Now, as women are increasingly joining militaries, uh, what has the protection of vulnerable women as a core motivator been replaced with, you would say? Uh, would it be protection of society as a whole, protection of democracy? What are we protecting? Is there a gendered aspect to this as well? I think that's an interesting comment. If you'd like to say a word on that, Luis, you are free to. But if you'd like to spend your final two minutes saying something else, that's also up to you. So I'll uh, leave the final two uh, minutes to you before uh, we say thank you. Please, Luis. Thank you, Henrik. Wow, that, that's a, a challenge and really, really good uh, questions. I, I think uh, Pinar has a, a really, really interesting point and also uh, Turin, I think the sort of what motivates and what generates and how I guess it also goes to the narrative that both Eric and, and Michael has brought up in terms of what are the core components in, in the narrative and in the recruitment to the military. And I think this, this speaks uh, very much to that. Uh, I would actually like to uh, maybe uh, respond to those and by, by placing it in a, in a, uh, in a Swedish-Norwegian context in a, a slightly different time back to the fact that we're now going back to national defense. We're going building a total defense. And I, I've been sort of struck by the lack of discussion about gender equality and women, peace and security and those resolutions 
in the Scandinavian political and uh, defense context that we actually have a, a gap here in terms of th th these are sort of issues that we primarily focus on international operations, but I would say actually talk to who has a, a view on uh, on and, and an input on national defense like Eric uh, uh, brought up. Um, at the political strategic level, what kind of defense do we do we want? Do we perceive the military to be a legitimate democratic tool that is governed by political uh, decisions? Uh, and and if, if, if so, what does this mean from a gender and feminist perspective? Many feminists are very critical to the military as, as a, a, a tool of the state, whereas others perceive it more from a liberal feminist perspective as in equal rights for many women. We have decided democratically we're going to have a defense and in the defense decision there is a call for increased number of women and reducing harassment, for example. So politically, we have made these decisions, but there's still a, I would I would really like to see a broader debate on on these issues also in in the Swedish uh, and Norwegian context. Um, and and then I guess it also uh, that also goes to Pinar's point in terms of what what kind of national interest and, and priorities go into these kind of, of core uh, decisions. Thank you very much, uh, Luis, and thanks to all of you. I know all of our three speakers will be happy to receive further comments. If you can't find their uh, emails, uh, just contact Luis or Torun or me and we'll be happy to pass on questions. And I think a good way of summing up our thank you is a comment we just got in the uh, chat section where uh, Commander Marta Gabriel from uh, the Portuguese Navy Recruitment Center says thank you for putting the seminar up and for voicing such an important topic. Uh, and, and thanks to the presenters for their willingness to share their thoughts, knowledge and experience. I couldn't say it much better myself. So thanks to everyone who spent uh, this morning during the Oslo Peace Week with us. On behalf of PRIO and the uh, PRIO GPS Center, not least, uh, thanks a lot for taking part in these debates. A special thanks to uh, to Toyota and, and Kelly for putting so much work into uh, not just preparing the seminar, but uh, helping out with the research on, on the topic. Uh, and I wish all of you a wonderful day in spite of Omicron and whatever there is, there are other topics in the world. And these sorts of seminars remind us of that too, which uh, kind of gives us a mental boost, boost I would say. So once again, thanks so much, uh, not least to our presenters, and I wish you all a wonderful day. Thank you.